but it is 1.30 or so in the afternoon. Today is, today is the 2nd, Friday the 2nd of September, 1994, and I'm speaking with Mrs. LaGrange Dupre of Athens, Georgia. And Mrs. Dupre, what was your maiden name? My name was Trussell, LaGrange Trussell. And uh, I'll have to tell you that we say Dupree. And uh, I don't know, but we just do. And so uh, I married Dan Dupree, who was a native of Athens also. We both grew up here in Athens. Only thing is, I went to the University of Georgia, and he went to Georgia Tech and graduated there in 1939. And uh, he was in the, Army Res uh, in the Army Reserve while he was at Georgia Tech. He was in the Coast Guard artillery. And uh, when he was called up in uh, 19 September of 1941, before Pearl Harbor, and you know, it was the following December. But anyway, he, he went to Aberdeen, Maryland to uh, the old proving ground up there because his coast artillery had been changed to the ordnance department. He had been assigned to ordnance, which was a place where they tested uh, big guns and uh, which in a sense it was not a bad jump from coast artillery to to ordnance but anyway he went there and stayed uh, a couple of months and then was assigned to the mid up in to a town in the midwest in Madison Indiana and it was called the Jefferson Proving Ground and uh, he enjoyed being there and while he was there he uh, we got married, and I moved up there to Madison with him. And uh, we were about a, there about a year, and he was adjutant of the proving ground there. And as such, he got to read all the mail that came across for the colonel. And, uh, you know, before you turn it over to the boss, that kind of thing. And in that... Uh, mail there was an account about how in the Air Force you could go through flight training in grade which in other words instead of going in as a student pilot he could go in as a first lieutenant and learn how to fly and then uh, change from ordnance department to the Air Force. So he took the letter in to the colonel and uh, showed it to him and said he would like to do this. And the colonel said, well, all right, but don't you tell anybody else. <laughs> he said, you can go, and I'll sign it for you. But uh, So that's how he happened to get out of one service into the other service. And then he went. I always said he, he could have stayed at the ordnance department during the entire war and not have ended up in a prison camp, but uh, that wasn't what suited him. So... Uh, he went to uh, went into flight tra training, and uh, by he did not get his wings until uh, the spring of 1944. And then he learned to went from eventually we went to El Paso, where he learned to fly a B-24 Liberator bomber. And in September of 44, he was sent overseas to Italy. And uh, in, he completed about, uh, I don't know, 12 or 13 missions and then was shot down by the Germans and over Vienna, Austria. And from that time on, he was a prisoner until the Russians liberated his prison camp in May of 1945. And uh, he came home late, uh, in June of 45, and that was, but his experiences in prison camp were uh, interesting, and uh, he was very hungry all the time in prison camp. They didn't get much to eat, but they managed. It was interesting that when, when he got to, to, to the prison camp, there were 
5,000 people in the camp, and many of them had, particularly the British, had been there for five years. So he felt that he was uh, lucky to be there only five months. Where was the camp? The camp was on the Baltic Sea in uh, what later became a, a part of Germany that was under the Russian rule, and uh, it was called B-A-R-T-H, Bart. And uh, it was very cold there. And, uh, I don't exactly know where, where to start as far as uh, I guess we might, you, I might like to tell you that uh, when he was shot down in Vienna, he landed on a barracks, and a barracks, a German barracks, and he did not get dirty. His uniform was not dirty at all. And uh, he was very blonde and didn't look unlike a German. So he was taken into uh, and put in solitary for a while, and then uh, he, uh, another young man came from a United States Airman was put in there with him, and he looked at him and he wouldn't talk to him because he thought it was a spy because he wasn't dirty like he was. <laughs> and but anyway, when Dan opened his mouth and started talking to him, he had such a, such a southern accent that he realized that he was <laughs> he was for real. <laughs> It's interesting that the accent mm -hmm. turn, turned, the, turned the corner for him. It really is. But uh, they just stayed in, in Vienna there for a few weeks and then were transported up to Bath. Let me back up and ask about some of your own experiences because I'd like to come back to, to your husbands. And, and um, I'm interested in your own experiences of the World War II era as well. And I'm, I'm wondering what you heard of, of this. Were you able to, to write and were your letters censored? Uh, yes, I be believe they were censored. What I heard, I didn't know. Uh, he, he was shot down on the 11th of December and I did not have notice of that until the day after Christmas. And I received a, a, a telegram from the War Department saying that he was missing in action. and. Of course, we all, I felt pretty much knocked for a loop because you you don't know what missing in action is, means. But uh, several weeks later, I guess, maybe six weeks later, around the 4th or 5th of February in uh, 1945, I had uh, a telephone call in the evening. and from this woman in Kentucky who said that she had heard on the shortwave radio that my husband was a prisoner. And uh, she had copied the message that she'd heard. So that was pretty exciting for me to hear that he was alive. And uh, what, had, what had happened was when they were taken, when they were captured, they were given uh, they thought that they would be in, that, they, that their families would be notified. And they, so they filled out a form, a message. Well, what the Germans did was to, was to turn these forms over to Axis Sally. I don't know whether you're familiar with, with the, well, Why don't you tell me who Axis Sally was? She was a, a woman that spoke for Germany in for propaganda trying to convert people to the German side and tell everybody how good the Germans were and how the war was going and so on. And this, these broadcasts came over shortwave to, uh, I can't remember the name of the station, something America. And, and I did not, I was not able to get the broadcast and didn't know about looking at it. But, a, but anyway, to make a long story short, the, after I heard from the, the lady on the telephone, then I got all these messages from people that 
they wrote. I got postcards and letters from, I had almost uh, 80 uh, confirmations of the fact, I mean, other people had heard it all over the eastern coast. There were people that were listening to these broadcasts. And so that was even more exciting. It began to feel like maybe it was really true. <laughs> but uh, then I had a, a telegram from the War Department saying that they had heard it also and to, that they were investigating it and pleased not to accept it as truth, but they hoped it was true or something like that. And so then about four or five days after that, they confirmed that the Red Cross had told them that it was true, that he was a prisoner. And so as far as I was concerned, it was a big time in Athens after that. But. Uh, he always said that he knew I was okay, but that I didn't know that he was all right because cause I worried for fear he didn't have enough to eat and things like that. But uh, during the rest of the time, there were a lot of us. I, I worked downtown in a, in a men's clothing store. Full time? Uh, half a day. Uh -huh. And uh, it, the store later burned, it's down there in the middle of the block across from uh, where Tony's used to be, where there's a restaurant there. Do you remember the name of the store? The Guns Men's Store. I just heard about Guns Men's Store and the, and the fire from uh, the earlier interview subject today was the accountant who cleaned up the books. Oh, really? After, mm -hmm. and he, he told me a, a few things that he asked me to make, be sure the, the thing was off uh, about the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, just in that, um, yeah, I guess the fire was like 1970 or 71. Right, it's been a long time ago. And, uh, well, but anyway, I worked there. I had known Mr. Gunn. In fact, he had been an usher in our wedding, and so that he asked me to come and work for him part time, and and it, it was something for me to do, and. Uh, I don't know whether he was just being nice, but I think I helped him. And I'm sure he did. We, uh, I have to, not long ago I, I saw a young man that uh, worked in there when I was there. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, he said, I remember when you got the word that Dan was a prisoner. And uh, so he, Mr. Gunn had the habit of asking a lot of students to work in the, in the uh, store. They also worked part-time, and he just said, I remember how excited you were when you got the word that he was okay. But uh, I don't know, I kept as busy as I could, but it, uh, and there were lots of people in Athens that were more or less in the same boat, lots of single women, husbands gone, and then there were a lot of people that didn't have as good news as I had had, too, because I knew one that was turned out and killed in the same sort of shoot down that they had had. But uh, we were lucky, and I, I just, because uh, it seemed to me that everything was in slow motion <laughs> during sure. the war, and that you that it was took a long time to get over and all that. Now, how long you worked at Guns Men's Store? I worked there from um, from September until the following June, about nine months, and then uh, when Dan came home. Then I went with him. We went. He's still in Paris until the war wasn't really over until August of '45, with when the Japanese surrendered. And of course, they didn't. It wasn't over until the Uncle Sam said you could leave. He's us. So there were various times, but he did. He was out and. Uh, he came back to work here. Uh, my father was in the Ford business and had been for years. And when Dan got out of Georgia Tech, he had been working in, at 
decor at the uh, Laterno plant, which is up there then. What did they make at the Laterno plant? Big earth moving sh machinery. And they later moved to California, or they have a plant out there now, I think. Uh, they combined with some people. But when he, after he'd been in prison camp and been gone so long, and my daddy offered him a job at the Ford place, then he decided he would like to stay at home, and that's what we did. The war was over. That's going too fast. That gets no, the war out not. too. Um, let me though and ask some other questions about your life. Um, first of all, while we're on the subject, how did you meet your husband, and when were you married? Well, um, I can't really remember when I met him. I lived at the corner of Millage and Cloverhurst, and he lived in the middle of the block there, and we were neighbors. And his mother was a Sunday school teacher, and she and we were all belong to the Episcopal Church, and she'd gather us up and take us all to, to church and Sunday school, so that I, I knew him that way too. But. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we came to, we went to some meetings when we were in, in the, I was in the University of Georgia and he was at university, I mean at Tech, and he, he was involved with the YMCA and I with the Y, the Women's Y on campus here. And through that we got to meet each other sort of away from home and, and maybe that was what started us going together. We went to Blue Ridge, North Carolina, and I was going with him then, so I guess I went with him three or four years before we finally married. But as I say, I've known him all my life. And when were you married? We were married in June of 1942. I graduated from university in 41, and he, he from Georgia Tech in 39. And we got married in 19... 42, June, he got gotten promoted to first lieutenant and he thought he could afford to have a wife. So he, that's how we happened to wait that long. What did you study at the university? I had got a degree in business administration and his degree was in mechanical engineering. That, uh, and that, of course, it's, I worked several places like doing the same sort of things as I did for Mr. Gunn, and worked in the office and helped with the accounting you know, all that kind of stuff. If I may ask, one of the questions I, I um, have asked everyone is, can you recall where you were on December 6th, was it 1941, um, the evening of Pearl Harbor or the morning of Pearl Harbor? Was it si December 6th Seven. or 7th? December 7th, mm -hmm. my mistake. Can you recall that for me? Yes, I was. I was in Atlanta, and we. I had spent the night over there with an old friend, and it was. We were all stunned, and I got in the car and came home because I. I don't know. I think everybody wanted to be at home, and it's a touch base. And I thought perhaps that Dan would call me and talk to me, and he did. Because. <laughs> what he was doing then. He had no idea of going overseas, but uh, it certainly changed everything, and it was all, well, very disturbing. And I also remember when President Roosevelt died, and he came through Athens on the train when they, when they took him back to Washington, his body. From Warm Springs? Mm-hmm. At least I, I believe he did, but we went down to the train station, but uh, and it, may, it was a very sad time, very moving that so many people were there, and I think all along the way when, the, when his uh, body was taken back to Washington, that that was the way that people were stunned and, you know, like, what's going to happen to us now? Um, where was the train station then? Well, the train station was 
There's no sta no train station anymore. I haven't been down there in so long. It was at the foot of Clayton Street. And you, that was the seaboard, okay? And the seaboard was over there where the family counseling service is. But uh, I can't remember the name of that. Do you know where the Bethel Homes are? Yes, I do. And it was back, back in there, behind that, way down the hill. And the Board of Education office is on the right there on Clayton Street. And then you go on down beyond. And there's an underpass. And on, just before you get to the underpass, you went to the road station. Well, Wish we you, had it still. So do I. But I, I try to ask as many objective questions as I can mm -hmm. as well. And here's a subjective question. Can you recall what you thought of Roosevelt at the time, 50 years ago? Well, I was a great admirer of his, and I did not have any, uh, even now that I know more about him, I, I still am an admirer of his. I mean, he, he was uh, quite a remarkable man for as uh, crippled as he was, and, uh, I have <laughs> come to admire that. So, <laughs> but uh, and I think he was smart, and I, I, I guess I can't really make judgments about everything. I had taken the course called Social Security in the in. Uh, college and when I in the business school and it was just starting then and of course he was he had been there since 1932 it was very uh, a lot of people think that that's what's wrong with us that we have social security but I'm not sure about that and that I I, uh, I just have to say we haven't really got time to talk about all that <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I ask a little bit of it, but uh -huh. I'll move on. Um, your husband came home when? He, ca he got home in late June of 1945. Can you tell me anything about what he told you about being liberated? Yes. When uh, he, w he was liberated on the 10th of May, what happened was they, the, the Russians liberated their prison camp and there was great excitement and the, what then all the Germans that had been guarding had either left or been captured by the Ru Russians. And the, the Russians were pleased to be liberating them and they uh, proceeded to comb the countryside and uh, to get food, and they met, had some pigs that they killed, and they had a barbecue, and that was, I think, the most impressive thing that Dan told me, that people were excited and were eating so, and it was festive, and one of the young men died from overeating, which was just uh, terrible after all that time, but... Uh, I don't think it was the food, I just think he overate. But the, there was lots of goodwill between the feelings between the Russians and and the prisoners in the camp. And they were, and then after that, he uh, shortly after that, he was sent to Camp Lucky Strike on the coast at La Havre, France. And I guess they kept him there four or five weeks because the Army didn't want them to come home looking like they did, and they were, and they fattened them up. Is what happened, that, which was okay, I guess. But um, he talked about they they hadn't had any eggs in so long, and they would go across the to the to the French people and and bargain with cigarettes for eggs, 
and which was fine with the French apparently. And they have wonderful omelets and it's strange what you miss if you haven't eaten anything like that for months, but they, they were yearning for eggs. But then after he came home, we had, he had of course missed Christmas. So we celebrated Christmas. In June? Actually, on the 4th of July. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And he's got the whole family together and had, had uh, turkey and all the trimmings and everything, just like we would have at Christmas. In Athens? In Athens, mm -hmm. And where did you live as a married couple in Athens? Well, I've lived three, we've lived in three different places, but uh, I've, we first lived out on Carlton Terrace. There's a marker out there that marks that as the highest, mark, the highest elevated place in Clark County. Did you know that? No, I've jog, jogged by there many times, but I did mm -hmm. not know that. We lived at 160 Carlton Terrace in a garage apartment, and right in that yard is a bronze marker, which was interesting to us. And then we. Uh, We were going to have a baby, and we moved into a house. So we'd have a little more room. And we lived at uh, 280 Stanton Way. And we stayed there for a couple of years, and we were going to have another baby, so we moved over to Springdale to, another, to a bigger house. And uh, we stayed there for 10 or 12 years, at the corner of uh, where Fortson Drive comes into Springdale, you know where that is? And then uh, in 1960, we moved to Cloverhurst, which was very close to where we had grown up. And in fact, we were just around the corner from where Dan's mother still lived in his house, the, there at 745 Millage Avenue. That was a nice old house that was torn down last year. And you probably have seen this uh, just an empty place there. As a matter of fact, I lived around the corner at 137 Springdale for the last two years. Oh, you have, well, you I know, right? I moved in June. The, mm -hmm. the, new, uh, the new owner has uh, done much nicer things than my landlord has to the mm -hmm. house. Um, Are you still there? No, I, I moved. Mm -hmm. I'm meant to Halo now. Mm -hmm. uh, don't often throw those things in. I would love to hear you read a little bit, some, some, section, of, some section of what you brought in aloud. All right. Your choice. Well, I'd like to read the part that uh, talks about what happened on that day that he was shot down. If I can find it. Here it is. This is an article that was in the Athens Observer and was written by Phil Williams on the 12th of July. 1979. It is early December 1944. The bomber with its 10-man crew is over Vienna and the pilot is Lieutenant Dan Dupree of Athens. Anti-aircraft fire gets heavier and black mushrooms of smoke mark the explosions across the sky. Flying shrapnel sounds like gravel falling on the roof of the plane. There is a sudden roar and a crash, and the plane's controls lose response. A shell has slammed into one wing of the B-24. Dupree and his co-pilot pull the controls with all their strength, but the plane begins a lazy spiral downward. Dupree works frantically at the controls. He watches the altimeter. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet, the plane is dropped. When it has plunged 5,000 feet, Dupree admits the inevitable. They are going to crash. He doesn't have much time to worry about his crew. They are all his friends, those other nine. They flew, back, they flew together back in the States during training, and this is only their 18th mission over Germany. He gives the order to bail out, and one by one, they all safely drop from the craft as it heads toward the ground. Dupree is the last to leave the plane. Thank you very much. Would, since we've got this right of hand, would you show off your husband's air medal there? 
This is his air medal, and this is a, the little article that was in the Athens paper on the 29th uh, telling about the notice that I received that he was missing in action. Would you read that aloud? Notice has been given the wife of Dan Dupree, the former Miss LaGrange Trussell, that her husband is listed by the War Department as missing in action since a flight over Austria on December the 11th. Son of Mrs. Bertha Dupree and the late Dr. Dan Dupree, he was the pilot of a liberator. He graduated from Athens High School and Georgia School of Technology, entering the service in 1941 while working as an engineer on the staff of the Letourneau Company in Tacoa. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also interested in the rest of your lives. Um, I've been looking upon this project also as I get to get a capsule history of a generation in some ways. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me some of the life story of your husband and yourself in the last 50 years? You can start anywhere you like, but how about the end of, from the end of World War II? Well, um, I think I told you earlier that Dan and I went to the same church, and when when he came back, he became involved in church and teaching Sunday school, and uh, I did too, and we we did that. And later on, this was a manual Episcopal church, and later on, he became the superintendent of the Sunday school, and I continued to teach off and on. He did lots of. Uh, civic-minded things. He uh, worked with the, he was the chairman of the Association. He was very much interested in the preservation of, uh, well, I mean, looking after some of the old trees that we have around here and not having, not letting everything get paved, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, it's an important legacy. He. Uh, did that, and then he, uh, the day before he died, he worked at the Athens Food Bank and the and the um, church thrift shop. He was always doing things like that. He worked at Trussell Ford until 1985, I guess, and he had had uh, several heart attacks, and he decided that they decided it would be best for him to retire. And it was at a reason he was 62. And, uh, but we both did a lot of things and I was a member of the Junior League of Athens and was the president one year. And uh, I was on the school board for 16 years. Which 16 years were those on the school board? I was on from 1955 to 1965, and then I was off again until 1970. I don't know whether you're familiar with the school board, but uh, it's elected now. In those days, it was elected, and I was appointed again in 1973. Uh, uh, anyway, I, had, did, I don't know if it was 72 or 73, but uh, did had six more years, so it was 10 and 6 was what it was. It's quite was, a long time of service. I was chairman of the board for the for three years also. Which three were those? I guess it was, I can, I'm trying to think, I, I believe that it was, must have finished in 1978. So uh, that was, it would be 78, 77, and 76. Dr. Charles McDaniel was, was superintendent then, and he, he left us but became state superintendent. And took Dr. Werner Rogers with him, and mm -hmm. now Dr. Werner Rogers is the state school superintendent. Let's see, after that I've uh, I've been I got interested in the library and uh, 
I got asked to be a board member, and I had been a board member since, uh, I guess, since 1982. I filled an unexpired term, and so and I'm not supposed to serve but 10 years unless you complete an, an, an unexpired term. So I am finishing my 12th year on the, on the library board this year. In a long time of service. But uh, I signed your check the other day. I'm very grateful. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a wonderful job, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm interested in one thing in particular um, there's been so many changes in the last um, couple of generations, in the last 50 years. A time of service on the school board from 1955 to 65 must have made the Brown versus Board of Education decision right at the top of, of your mind. Indeed it did. We, uh, we did not have any uh, great confrontation confrontation in our school system. We very carefully tried not to. And uh, in fact, we journeyed to Washington several times during the second go round of my uh, school board service. But uh, I was telling you about working for Gunn's Men's Store. When I was on the Board of Education, Mr. Gunn's son, who was, had been overseas when, when Dan was overseas, Anyway, he he returned, and he also was in Athens, and uh, he was chairman of the Board of Education, and I guess it was in 1960 that we had the most confrontation probably around here, but uh, he was picketed by the NAACP, and, and the, uh, uh, well, what would be the opposite? I can't put it's my, uh, Opposite, maybe Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? SNCC. No, it was the... It, SCLC was Martin Luther King. No, but the, he was picketed by the Ku Klux Klan and oh the NAACP God. on the same day, okay? We figured we had to be doing something right. <laughs> but uh, we... Uh, I have to say that during my first term on the school board, we closed numbers of, uh, of black schools because, I mean, they were not equal. I can, there was a school, by, uh, a one-room schoolhouse on, out on the Timothy Road and another one out on the road near the airport. It was just, it was certainly time we did something. But I, I don't know, what, I'm probably overstepping what you want to hear. No, actually, I, as I say, I, I've been able to ask some questions of the generation that passed through World War II, and that's mm -hmm. part of the set of experiences that I'm, I'm very curious about. Um, I also, my daughter, we live on Cloverhurst, and uh, we're within three blocks of Barra School. And uh, when my daughter, was born in 58, so that I guess it must have been in 1968 that we had uh, the greatest uh, changeover in, with blacks going to form all, all, formerly all-white schools. And anyway, we were, I was not on the school board then, but anyway, we was zoned is the word we use, she, the, her school zone. She had to go to West Broad School, which was over on Broad Street, which was considerably far from our walking distance to, to Barra School. But that was just one of the things that had to be done. And she uh, did not, then she went to, uh, to junior high over here, or to where it's Clark Middle now. And that was one of the schools that we helped, I helped build. It was one of the first ones that we built. We built a lot of schools in that era, in that time, that era. Era, I guess. <laughs>
Let me take you back to the era of World War II. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the morning of June 6, 1944? We were, communication was not like it what is now. And I don't, I can't, I, I, now, I mean, we can just hear immediately, you know. But you couldn't, and Dan went, and I were out in uh, Texas, and he was flying and learning how to fly that plane and everything, and I can't, I can't remember. We of course found out about it through the newspapers later, and it was very exciting, but it, it was not as, uh, I mean, until you got to see the longest day, you know, that kind of thing. That, uh, how long do you think it was before you saw a newspaper or heard from someone here in Texas? Well, I'm just maybe the next day or so on. Uh -huh. But still, it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't in the news then how important it was. I don't think to the rest of the country. And as it soon became, we we realized how important it was. But. Everybody was so caught up in what they were doing and themselves and how far we were. And then, I mean, this thing, you and me talking, the biggest change in our life in, is communication. It's just changed a whole lot. Well, you, you were, when were you born? 1963. Mm -hmm. Well, see, my daughter was born in 58, so you did you have a radio during those years? We World did. War II? We did. I can't remember that we had one in the car, though. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we did. And uh, we had one at, at home, but we didn't listen like we do now. We just hadn't gotten. I have thought about it a lot because we discussed. Somebody else said, Where else were you? I was much more aware now when I, I've been to Europe several times. and. Uh, two years ago, I went to Cambridge, and I was the the uh, cemetery there that honors the airmen in all the. The in, Aria. Mm -hmm, our, well, no, this is the American cemetery. Oh yes. And it's there, that for the Air Force, and, but it was that was very moving, and it's it's a beautiful place. And I think you got more of a feel about what went on over there when you stayed there and see those, it's like those people going over that D-Day and those miles and miles of crosses. And, and I, I, have you been to Verdun? Uh, no. Well, that's another place where you, the war was just so much more a part of them. We've never, of course the South has had a war, but nobody else around here has really had any. <laughs> Where were you stationed in Texas? We were in El Paso, right across the line from Mexico. Can you remember some other notable events? Victory in Europe, that, that May of 1945? Well, I remember that very vividly, yes. I was here, and we were very excited. And, uh, um, I guess I remember the one in victory in Japan in August even more. Dan had uh, had a friend, General Hunter Harris, who was in Athens, and he had uh, come from Washington in a plane. And Dan had not flown since he was shot down. So in August of 1945, I guess it was the 13th of August, he, uh, well, I, I, I guess he left here on the 14th, which was the day. But they didn't know that it was the day. And so when they got up to, to Washington, they were told that they must circle and because it was that the Japanese had surrendered and they'd have to wait until they could get down. And then when they got down, they said, there'll be no more flying out of here. <laughs> so everything closed, everything up in Washington closed. And he 
he got to see all the celebration that was there because some friends of ours that live here in Athens were stationed in Washington and they came out to Andrews Air Force Base and got him so he could spend the night with them and they they say if they hadn't if he hadn't been there they wouldn't have seen it all you know because they would have just the everybody was just so excited and so um, glad it was over but anyway he uh, he couldn't get back home after he got up there, and there he was, and he had flown with the general, but the general, could, they wouldn't let him fly out of, back to Athens in the plane, so he caught a ride in an airplane and flew to Charleston, and then he could not get to Atlanta or anywhere, and he had to ride the bus home from Charleston. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he finally made it back. I'm losing. losing this thing. But that, I guess, is my most, I was really, I thought, well, why isn't he here to celebrate? And, but it was memorable for him to be in Washington. But you had had to stay home in Athens. Right. I did not go, you see. I was left at home. In fact, a friend were having a party, and he had he missed the party, too. So. Was it a victory party? No, it's just that they were happen to have were going to have a party that night. It what well, turned out to be a victory party. Can you give me some description of Athens fifty years ago? Um, where were the movie theaters? Where did the people go? Well, there was a movie theater right along you know where the CNS bank is now. There was a movie theater right beyond that down sort of where there's an underground restaurant or something in there, I think. Near there there was, there was a movie called The Strand. And we used to go there when we were growing up. Maybe we could go in for a nickel. But uh, I guess in fifty years ago would be nineteen forty four, wouldn't it? The palace was the main theater, and it was over there where the parking garage is. And then I guess the Georgia Theater, where they have all the uh, rock bands and things come, was there too. But but there was no theater down there below. And uh, there are many towns now that don't have any theater. It's amazing. I go up to Highlands, North Carolina, in the summer, and well, there we we rent movies, but we don't get to the closest movie house is thirty miles away. Where did you enjoy eating in those days? Was was there a, a restaurant you could go to? Were there several? Well, um, when we were coming along, uh, Costas was there, and it was a nice restaurant. And I cannot, for the life of me, think of me. There have been, well, we used to always stop into, in the middle of the night at a place across the street from, from the Georgian Hotel. I can't think of the name of it. And Tony's was there. But not nearly so many restaurants as there are now. Nice restaurants. There was the club, which a nice dining room at that time. It was up on Millage Avenue. And Dan was very much involved with the Elks, and we went there quite often. And uh, he also played golf, so we were involved with the other country, I mean, the country club, too. I played golf also. Really? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you played golf? Well, I had an automobile accident in 1982 and messed up my hip. And uh, I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things on machines now, but I don't walk great lengths. I can walk as much as two or three miles, but I don't. Were you playing golf right up until then? Yes, but you can tell from listening to me that I went to a lot of meetings and I didn't, I just didn't practice enough golf. You got to, if you're going to play golf really good, you got to practice. Well, let me go back to food because it's something that everyone has in common. And another thing that people had in common back then was rationing. 
Can you tell me anything about um, the home economics here in Athens in those days? Well, I can remember things that we had never eaten before. <laughs> I had, uh, well, there was a, down there where the, the restaurant that moved, you know, the one, um, you know where the Morton Theater is? Yes, I do. And there was a, a cross, diagonally across there. We call that Hot Corner down there. Mm -hmm. And anyway, there was a restaurant there. Mr. Burton had a, uh, I mean, not a restaurant, but a, uh, he had a, a meat market, that's what I'm trying to say. And we losing something. No, we're fine. But uh, we we would buy, my mother would buy goat, and I had never eaten goat before, but it was not rationed, and we cooked it just like we would a leg of lamb. It was young goat, and it was delicious. That was the only thing that I remember. Um, we had vegetables, and we had chicken. I don't remember suffering from the rationing. Somebody would always manage, I guess we, we had enough to pie and stuff, but uh, I mean enough sugar. That would be the, the sugar was rationed. I guess the thing that worried us most was the gasoline rationing, because you really had to plan to get, in order to get somewhere and to save up coupons to in order to go from one place to another. Where were you traveling in your car in those days? Well, Dan and I traveled from El Paso to uh, to Athens, and that was the longest way that we had. We had uh, also traveled 17 different places during the time that he was in the Air Force before he went overseas. I mean, and that was just during the training period because we moved every two months, and we were just like. A turtle, we had our home on our back and everything in the car. But uh, I, uh, he took beginning flight tra training at uh, Southerfield in Americas, which I don't know whether you know, but the, that's where Lindbergh learned to fly too. No, I didn't know that. And anyway, that was where he, where Dan soloed. At Southerfield. In America's Georgia. In America's Georgia. There's somebody else here. Have you have you Bucky Redwine? Yes, I have. Well, he he learned to fly that too. Did he not tell you that? He did. Um, I I uh, wasn't thinking of it at the time. Mm -hmm. He mentioned it. But we loved Americas, and from Americas we went to. Oh, we went to Maxwell Field. We went that twice, and we. When finally Dan got his wings in Columbus, Mississippi, we had lived in Greenwood, Mississippi for two months before we got to Columbus. And it just was, and then we came home for a little while, then we went to Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> and uh, Topeka, Kansas. It was amazing how many times we moved, but I. I think that somebody, sometimes people didn't approve of wives going along. There were some members of the older generation that thought I should stay at home, but uh, there were, not many of us stayed at home, Brent. We stayed with them as long as we could. What did it feel like to you to leave the South and travel to those bases in Topeka, Kansas and Lincoln, Nebraska? Well, it was, uh, I never did, we had a good time, and I ran into, there's a, in Nebraska they call people, you know, they call themselves the Corn Huskers, and the name of that hotel was the Corn Husker. Well, you asked me where we ate, we always, I guess there were some hotels still going around, they're not anymore like that, now they're motels, but uh, there was a, a young man there that we had known from Athens that was stationed in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we all got together and ate. It was amazing how we were always bumping into somebody that we knew. And 
I don't know. I went not upset about moving around. I like folks anyway. So, and I liked the. We had a good time. In, I, I lived in Madison, Indiana, with him too. And in a sense, although Indiana is a, really a sort of a southern state. Mm -hmm. Was, I think during the Civil War it was sort of on at the edge of everything. But I can't remember uh, being too upset. I got upset out in El Paso. We got upset with the woman that we stayed with because she said that we uh, flushed the John too many times. <laughs> so Dan said, well, we will just move, and we did. Moved out to a motel and stayed in a place where we could they had uh, a small kitchen, and that was good. So for the next month, we and we stayed there. But there was some of that kind of disagreeableness uh, with people. But she was just cranky, you know. When your husband was overseas, and you were working here at the men's store, at Gunn's Men's Store, where were you living then? Well, I stayed with my mother-in-law part of the time and with my folks part of the time. Mm -hmm. And we, my folks lived at 785 Millage and she lived at 745 Millage. So that was, we, and my dad owned the house in between. So it, so we just, I mean, I was within one distance. And she, Dan thought it would be good for me to stay with her some. And so I did and loved, I had Nona, she was, she and my mother were friends, and I never had any mother-in-law problems. I had known her so long. She was, my mother, and she was such good friends that she was the godmother for my younger sister. So, you can see. Which leads to another question. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters younger than I am. One who lives in Atlanta and one who lives down at Jekyll Island. My sister that lives at Jekyll Island was married after the war. She was she was still in college when the war was going on, but she married a uh, Fred Griffith, and he parachuted into France and was uh, behind the lines. And he spoke French very well. And he had some interesting war experiences. We we actually know a lot of people, I guess, that did. I expect you found that out. Things. Well, he's, you know, Louis Griffith. Have you ever talked to him? Yeah, I've been trying to reach him, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, Fred is Louis's brother. Didn't know that. And, but uh, my uh, my sister Kitty lives in Atlanta, and she is ten years old, younger than I. And she was a just a little girl when I got married. Do you recall uh, dropping? The atomic bomb upon Japan, did that make any kind of news at the time? Yes, I think it did, a lot of news. In fact, I, I, we, it seems to me that was communicated a lot better than D-Day at the time. Maybe it was just me, I don't know, maybe that I was home and, and uh, People were beginning to come home because, you see, Dan was home when that happened. And, uh, we, you couldn't be helped but be shocked at all the, how many people were killed and what was happening. And I guess I, nevertheless, I was a great admirer of Mr. Truman's, and he was. You asked me about Mr. Roosevelt, but Mr. Truman was my favorite president. Why? I just think because he told it like it was. Never, I mean, he was a plain speaker, and I liked his background. And the, I can remember when he was running against Tom Dewey, and when he actually ran the first time of it. I guess it was the first time, wasn't it? And uh, everybody thought he was going to get win, and, and anyway, I mean, he was going to lose. And anyway, he won. You, I don't know. You must have seen recordings or something of when he imitated Carlton Bourne and all that, did you? Actually, I, I don't know that one. Mm -hmm. 
I've seen the famous photograph, Dewey, where he's holding the the headline that's misprinted. Right. <laughs> um, but I don't. I haven't heard this recording. Well, it was a H. V. Cole was a newscaster, and he had, had to said that Truman was going to lose, and anyway, Truman was on the, anyway, he spoke to everybody and he imitated Carlton Bourne, and he was very easy to imitate, but <laughs> we all got a great charge out of that. What happened to me was that uh, my mother and I both voted for Truman, mm -hmm. and we were so excited. My father said, Dewey, and he said, yeah, he got upset with us. <laughs> so, <laughs> But he came around later. I seem to be discussing politics with you quite a bit. May I ask about Georgia politics and uh, the, the three governors time? Do you recall that immediately after World War II? The, the, uh, the strife, I guess, between when, when Eugene Talmadge died? I do you have a memory I of do. that? I do. It was was that when Herman, Herman became the governor? For a short while before he became, for a long while, yes. Right. And there was some, some question about, about whether he was, should have been, and it was, what he was elected in the state legislature, wasn't that it? Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, Herman went to college, he was in school, in the law school when I was in college. And, uh, he married a, Betty Shingler was a friend of mine, his wife. She went to Georgia with me. But uh, uh, in 1933, I went to the Chicago World's Fair and had Georgia Day, and I can remember meeting Eugene Talmadge at that. Yeah. That was fun. But uh, I, 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 Mr. Russell was my favorite politician from this state, Richard Russell from Wind, Senator Russell. And I just thought he was great. I thought it was too bad that he didn't, I guess at the time that he came along, a Southerner could probably not have been elected. And later on, it was a surprise when Jimmy Carter got elected. But uh, Senator Russell was a real statesman, and I thought he did a lot for us in the Senate. I remember the other senator, Walter George, was our other senator. He was from the South, and I can remember when uh, President Roosevelt tried to pack the Supreme Court, and he came down here and was trying to tell it tell people not to vote for Senator George and that you know that never goes and when you come from up on high and tell the state anyway that just cemented it Senator George was reelected because nobody was going to let Senator I mean President Roosevelt tell them how to vote you see. Let me ask you this because that goes back to the years before World War II and the years of the Depression. Can you tell me anything about Athens during the Depression? Um, did, did life seem a little harder then? Were folks working harder during during the 1930s? I think I, we were all very much aware of the, of the Depression. I assume, you know, I've told you my dad was in the automobile business. And people weren't buying cars. And uh, they just were keeping the cars up just as, just, I mean, times were really tough. I started into junior high school in, I guess, 1932, 31 and 32, and I could, this first time I, we ever got involved in a carpool because it was a long way from where we lived. But my friend's father killed himself and that was because of the depression and there were things like that going on and I I wasn't very old but I was very much aware of how hard it ever was and I was you couldn't I mean you were scared you know when you when somebody's father kills themselves and himself and himself and it was it was really heartbreaking 
I don't think his family ever got over it. And there, there were things like that going on. I can't recall, though, that we were ever hungry. We, uh, there were people, and, and we helped as many people as we could, I think, to, during that time. Well, that's a great deal. Um, I'm reaching for another question, but I'm going to ask you the question I tend to ask last in these interviews. Okay. Um, looking back upon those experiences that we've been talking about, if you were talking to younger people who only knew of the era of World War II through history and books and videotapes like this one, mm -hmm. is there something you would underscore or would think is most important from that experience? Is there something that you uh, would like them to remember the most? Well, I certainly hope that they will remember to talk in that fight because I think that's very important. I hope the longer we can keep on talking and not shooting at each other. I look at the Look at the Irish and the. I hope they really have signed a peace agreement. I've been to Ireland twice and it's a lovely place. It's just a shame that it can't everybody feel good about, you know, and not worry about life and their children. And what? I'm was in Harrods in England, London, shortly after they had been a bomb there at Harrods in London. I guess that's probably the thing I hope would, if we could just stop shooting each, each other, and I wish we could all learn to read. <sighs> I really do. Because uh, we've got all this information highway and everything going on, but we, st we still need to learn to read. I'm pleased at our literacy program over here. And I, I, I just don't know. I've been, I read a book the other day and it was wonderful what, what happens. It's such a miracle when somebody learns to read that hadn't learned, read and ever. I mean, a like grown person. What Archie does down there is just great. He is still down there. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> I hope so. That's enough. That's a great deal. Um, anything you'd care to add about the war, about World War II, or about your husband, or about um, your lives? Um, anything at all that I haven't touched on? No, we a long time. But... Well, thank you for your time, Ms. Dupree. 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 Ms. Dupree. Mm -hmm. I'll have to tell you that a lot of people around here say Dupree. Oh, yeah. <laughs>